Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch, maybe especially those desserts. Uh, but everything was good, wasn't it? Well, we're back. We have one more full session and then our Q&A session. So these are your last opportunities to get your questions into the basket. Um, but I'm going to invite Dr. Gabe Floor back for his last full lecture. Thanks, brother. Thank you all again so much for your patience, for, for being here, for staying here, for coming out in the snow. Um, this is what we say back home. This, this is a show enough snowstorm y'all got here. So <laughs> it's coming down. Um, let's see some sunshine there. Praise God. Let's finish up at the end of Joseph's story in Genesis 50, and we'll read verses 1 through 26, and let's pray together again before we hear God's word. Our Father, thank you for the food that nourishes us, for the way you water the earth and causing it to sprout and bring forth bud and blossom. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you have cared for us in the Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. We pray that you would bless this time we have together and use your word to build up your church for the holy mission that you have for her. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 50, beginning at verse 1. Then <clears throat> Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die in my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There shall you bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father, and then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up. And bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went <clears throat> all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and the elders, all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, it was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation, and he made mourning for his father seven, day, seven days. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the th threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place is Abel Mitzrayim. It is beyond the Jordan. Abel Mitzrayim means mourning of Egypt. Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them, for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham brought from the field of Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. <clears throat> when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgressions transgressors and their sin because the e they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. 
I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. But God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being about 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. This ends the reading of God's word. May he add his blessing to it. So I mentioned in our last talk about the author Yuval Noah Harari and his 2017 bestseller was Homo Deus, which is Latin for man, the God, or the God man. And uh, that book is a, a detailed story about how mankind will conquer death through theology. And he, he, he sets up the book. It's interesting that he wrote this in 2017, and we were, we were talking about this last night, uh, Roger and Christine and, and Callie and I, and the fact that the first time I came out here was March of 2020, and that was like the last time we had a life for a while, was, was out here in Medford. It's a great place to be right before the shutdown. Um, so as you think about that and, and like this book being re- written in 2017, it opens up with like this really cheery analysis of what's happening in the world. It's like, basically, we're conquering disease, like, death's not going to be a big deal, and we're getting better at it all the time. And then you're like, okay, dude, right on. And he's like, and war's going to be a thing of the past pretty soon. It's just so optimistic, and then it's destroyed, right? But, but one of the things he writes in there, he, he's quoting, um, a, well, he's not quoting, he's making a point, then he says this, life has no script, no playwright, no product, pro- director, no producer, and no meaning. And that's his operating base to say, but be hopeful, okay? So everything's meaningless, but be hopeful. Okay, so that, that, that's the message. And we'll never find meaning in anything or everything in creation. We have to look outside of creation. That goes back to that one versus two. Um, we have to look to the Lord, and that's, that's what we're looking at in our final session here today, a short history of the meaning of everything. A pretty arrogant title, I know, but I'm trying to focus on the text. It's not my, my point. So here's, here's what we want to see from these, these verses. This, this ending of Joseph's story here reveals two things to us, at least. It reveals our limitation as creatures, our limitation as creatures, pace what like some of Harari believes, that we're kind of this unlimited technological potential. It reveals our limitation as creatures, even as it reveals God's exaltation in his absolute sovereignty. So even as we see our limitations, we see God's exaltation. So let's look there at our limitation, first of all. Um, Two central episodes in this chapter, the death of Jacob and the death of Joseph. They bookend the chapter. Uh, Jacob's death reveals that his brothers, that Joseph's brothers, still need to grow in their faith. Why? Because here's what their thinking is. All this time that Joseph's been kind to us, and we've just skipped over nine chapters to get here, or eight chapters to get here, from Genesis 41 where we left off. You had that confrontation of Joseph and his brothers. You have the way that he looks at them and says, here's, I need to reassure you about who I am and what I'm going to do for you. They have all these reassurances, right? And what they're thinking is, yeah, that's probably too good to be true. And the only reason he's doing this for us is because dad is still alive and he's scared of what, you know, dad will do to him if he finally punishes us for what we did to them. Their conscience is still so afflicted, they... They, they're going, this, this is too good to be true. And so even after Joseph shows them love, they believe this. And then Joseph's death reveals something else about faith. The brothers need to grow in their faith. When, Joseph's, when Joseph dies, he reveals 
that Israel had come back to his faith, and that Joseph shares the faith of Jacob. You will go up, and you will take my bones with you. The author of Hebrews, as we mentioned, talks about that. We'll come back to that in just a second. That's in Hebrews eleven twenty-two. But the brothers' fear here is what sets the stage for some of the most uh, glorious teaching I think we'll ever find in Scripture on the sovereignty of God and its relationship to the evil and suffering we experience in our responsibility as creatures. And so how does Joseph talk to us about limitations? So you go through this narrative of the mourning and all the people going up and God keeping his promises by Abraham burying in the land of Canaan, even though he hadn't possessed the promised land. That's such a prominent theme in the New Testament. But then all this calms down, and really the, the, the narrative zooms in the focus here. And the brothers, we don't know if they're being dishonest. We don't know what J- Jacob said to them. It's not recorded that, he's, that he said to them, be nice. But that's what they're saying. They're saying, this is what dad told us. They're still manipulative. Okay? They're behaving just like their father, Jacob, who was the deceiver. Okay, so they're still going, and this is what all of us do when we're afraid. We say, I've got to make the circumstances like fit, or I've got to, I've got to do something uh, in order to make it fit for my narrative, and I've got to protect myself. And that's, that's what even Jacob fell for. It's what all of us fall for when we feel threatened. We're going self-protection, even if it means lying, even if it means letting people down, whatever it is, we're going to do it to protect ourselves. That's what these brothers we're doing. And then Joseph has this beautiful response to them. He says, first of all, do not fear. And I, I would say that this is the, the apex of the story, and Joseph is never more like Jesus than right here. Did you notice how his, his exhortation to his brothers is bookended? Don't be afraid. And, and Jesus loves to say that to his disciples like us when we're afraid of what's happening in our lives. He says, do not fear. That's his command to us. And then notice how he puts this. He says, am I in the place of God? And, and, and here's what he's trying to get them to see that they've missed this whole time. They are still on this horizontal level of what they did. They feel guilty for the consequences. And what Joseph is trying to get them to see is you've got to move from the horizontal to the vertical to understand your guilt truly. And that's why he says, am I in the place of God? And he's asking that as a rhetorical question to get them to think about what they're doing, saying, you still don't understand who God is, guys. You still miss that point that that your real business is with God and what you did. And once you understand that, you'll understand my mindset, which is, I'm not here to judge you in that way. That's not my position. That's God's to do and God's alone. So their eyes are still on this world, and Joseph is saying, take your eyes off this horizontal plane and see who God is. And why, what were they doing here? They're bargaining. You know, hey, if you do this for us, you know, everything will be okay. And like, they're terrified, so they're self-protecting, and they bargain. And if you think about this for our own lives... The author of Hebrews in chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, says that Jesus is our older brother. And these brothers here still don't understand that their, their younger brother loves them. The brothers still mistrust the love of Joseph. And they didn't understand the character of their brother. And this is how we react to Jesus, isn't it? We don't understand his character. We don't believe his love is as good as he tells us it is. And so we bargain with him in the way he deals with us, don't we? we? We'd rather have Jesus leave us alone than bring pain into our lives, wouldn't we? If we're honest with ourselves at times. We'd rather have, hey Jesus, um, let me bargain with you on this one. Please don't take away what I really love, or please give me what I really love. And then, if not, just leave me alone. Don't keep messing with my life. And that's the mindset these brothers entered into with Joseph. They misunderstood the intentions of their brother, and that's because their eyes were just on this earth. And Joseph's question teaches us that we're limited creatures of God. So we have to to come to this same realization. We have to see that the greatest need we have is what Joseph's brothers needed, what Joseph had realized, that 
God alone is the judge. And friends, in our lives today, don't we need a fresh taste of that? That there's one judge? He alone is sovereign? And so many of us are, are into kind of being judgmental in the way we deal with people. And the sure sign that we haven't understood grace is when we become judgmental of other people. Like in, in immediately, like, just ask yourself this if you want to discern this. How quickly are you defensive if somebody says something negative to you? Or if you find out that somebody has said something negative about you, like, isn't our instinct to go, well, you know what, that person, whatever, we're going to go off on them in our minds. And that's when it gets delicious for us, doesn't it? Like, you, you have a bad interaction with somebody, you walk away, and in your mind you're playing, like, how you would really have said it to that person. And inevitably, you're always, like, schooling them, right? When you, when you go back and play that episode again, you're like, I would say this, and I'd get the better of them. And whenever grace has not taken hold of us, like it hadn't for Joseph's brothers, we begin to bargain with God, we begin to say, Jesus, kind of leave me alone, and we inevitably look at people around us and say, why can't they get their act together? Why don't they get it the same way I get it? You know? And, and Joseph's trying to get them away from that and trying to get us away from that. And he, he calms their fears and says essentially to them, if we can be anachronistic, you guys need to learn to walk by faith, not by sight. He calms their fears by teaching them their place as creatures. So Joseph looks ahead, verse 25, to the Exodus. He makes them swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my, bone, my bones from here. Did you see that dominant note of certainty in Joseph? And remember, he's not been given a vision about this like he had the other ones. He could be certain he, God showed him. Here, it's, I look by faith to the God who loves me, and I see what he's up to, and there's going to come a day when we are going to be led out of this land. Okay, and do and you see how this sets us up for the Exodus? What does Joseph ask Pharaoh? Please let me go up. What is going to be the first thing in Exodus 4 that they're going to ask? Please let us go. God's told us to go make a feast to him in the wilderness. And the one Pharaoh says, I'll let you go. The other says, no. It's a contraposition. It's meant to be. It's meant to be a, a distinction. It's meant to be a contrast here. So there Joseph says to them, here's the certainty you have to have about what God is doing. And we will never get that until we accept our limitations. And one of the things that modern life is geared to do is to make you think that your limitations will eventually be broken, that you'll eventually kind of be able to manage your life the best way you see fit. And that's what everything's geared towards, right? From your phone to all the modern conveniences, which are, are not bad things, you know, we can enjoy them, that's fine. But just be, realize we're all swimming in that cultural water that wants to bring us to a place of total self-dependency. And you can be assured that God's word is on a collision course with that. He's not going to ever let you get to a place where you don't need him, despite all of our striving and attempts to do that. There will never be a time where we can say to him, just leave me alone and let me do my thing. If you're his child, he loves you too much to ever let you be there. So know, know our limitations at the outset, and don't be fooled by the things that teach us that we don't have any limitations. And think about this as well. It's so easy to doubt God even after years and years of him showing us his love, isn't it? Like we, we can experience the love of God, we can know the love of God to us in Jesus, and then we can still begin to doubt. And one of the things that it's so tempting to do, especially if you've been a Christian for a little while, is let your faith run on the fumes of yesterday's experience of God's grace or the, 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 the fumes of your experience in God's word. And what God is always doing is, is saying to us what Paul said in Philippians, forgetting what lies behind. I press onward towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is how Joseph's been living. Have you noticed that his fame didn't get to him? His prison 
versus palace experience, he's still the same guy throughout. Why is that? Because he understood what Paul was talking about. He understood that his past wasn't going to define him and that his future was held in the hands of God, and therefore he had perspective on everything. That's why he did what he did. That's why he can say, remember your limitations. And that's why his brothers still don't get it yet. And then in verse 20 is kind of the, the, it's the apex of the whole story. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So you've got this absolute sovereignty of God we've seen throughout this whole story. And then you've got this intention language here. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to keep, to to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. And here's what we have to learn from this. Our actions, no matter how vile, no matter how much evil we see around us are still under God's absolute control. But here's where it gets tricky, doesn't it? Because all of us are going to ask this question at some point. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. You're going to have to come to grips with this. Like, if God is this sovereign, and that's where the Bible says on every page, then where is all this evil coming from? And here's the thing we can never retreat to. We can never say, oh, the devil made me do it. Or God's responsible for my sin. The Bible never says anything like that. Instead, as we talked about from Acts 2.23, it holds these both in tension. But notice how Joseph contrasts it. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And then he says, I also see the purposes of God in keeping a people alive today. For many, many people alive for himself. Here's what we're trying to get to here, friends. Our daily choices steadily, imperceptibly, almost unfathomably are leading towards an end. That's why Paul calls our walk walk with Jesus a walk. It's on a journey. It's on a destination. And yet, one of the hardest questions we face if we follow Jesus is, if God is totally sovereign and we're responsible, then why doesn't God stop some of the evil around us? And please notice that even if you opt for an answer that says, well, the reason why there's so much evil is because God gave us free will. That doesn't really solve the problem, does it? Because here's what you can, all that does is move the problem back a step. Because then you could just as easily ask the question, well, okay, then if God is good and he doesn't step in to intervene when he could prevent us from doing evil, then it doesn't strike me that, God is still really good. So you just move the question back a step. And what that author I mentioned earlier, what most people want to do is say, well, no, I don't want to believe in this God who's sovereign over everything. That just seems way too uh, hardcore, and it just seems like it's going to make God evil. No. We we have these scriptures like Isaiah 45 that I I cited. Uh, The Lord makes evil and makes good. The Lord kills, the Lord brings to life, 1 Samuel 2. You've got to balance those with also the Acts 2.23 and what Joseph is saying here. You meant it for this, God meant it for this. Friends, here's the great mystery. And I'm not trying to kind of like get out of this. But here's where you have to begin if you're ever going to make sense of this. You better and I better come to this subject knowing, as we just talked about, our limitations And being willing to say those three magic words, I don't know. I don't know why God does it like this. But here's what I will also tell you. If that's not an answer that seems satisfying to you, you're going to look a whole lot of different places and not find an answer. Because sooner or later, whether it's with this problem and the problem of evil, or it's with the problem of the Trinity or the inspiration of Scripture, whatever it is, you're going to come to some point where you're disagreeing with what the Bible says, and that's a decision point in your life. You're either going to at some point realize, I don't have all the answers. 
and I never will, and neither will anybody, anybody else, and therefore it's okay to say, I don't know. Or you'll become really arrogant and really proud. And you may not strut around like that, but it will show up in your life, and you will eventually not have an answer for anything that comes your way, because you'll be living out a futile worldview. So we are totally responsible. You meant it for evil. You guys did this. But God is absolutely sovereign. And here's what he says to that. Even though you meant this for evil, not even your sin can thwart God's plans. Have you ever thought about that with your own life? Joseph is telling his brothers, not even your own sin could thwart the plans of God. And in our lives, isn't it so easy to begin the lot, to, begin, to believe the lies of the devil that hey, I made all these poor decisions, I'm in this place, and God's forsaken me. And what we have to realize again and again is God doesn't, doesn't leave us where we are because of our sin. He's still got a plan. He's still at work. Your past is not sovereign. God is. Your present is not sovereign. God is. That's the hardest thing to realize. That's where Joseph, we see now as we began the story this morning, this arrogant 17-year-old is now a guy who's probably 50, who kind of gets it better than his brothers who are older, much older than he is. And when we think about this, when he says, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good, this is the meaning of everything, brothers and sisters. This is it. If you want to know like, what's happening in the world today while all of these intricate details are interesting, what, what is God up to? He is bringing everything that's happening in your life and in mine to a head in Jesus. He's going to consummate everything in him one day. Not your own sin, not the sins of others, not all the evil in the world is going to thwart that. And someday, when Jesus returns, this tapestry of life with all of the, dis of, of the tangled threads that seem disparate, disunified, disheartening, that we don't understand, will eventually emerge as a beautiful tapestry that God has been weaving the whole time. And the hardest thing to believe when you see just the tangled threads of the tapestry is that when God flips it over, it's going to be a beautiful picture. That's the hardest thing to believe when you're in the middle of hardship. Or if you just look around, um, you, you see like human trafficking, addiction, um, all, all the social evils we see around us, and, and, and it's so tempting to say, where are you in all this, God? And, and people you meet and evangelize are going to have these questions all the time. And you may be facing these things in your own life. God, I want a child. That is a really good desire, and so far you haven't given us one. Why not? God, I want my child to come back to Jesus. We've prayed for years, they haven't come back. Why? God, I want to be married. Am I still single? Isn't marriage a good thing? Don't you want that for me? And the more that God causes us to wait in a place we don't like, the easier it is for the devil to gain a foothold and say, all this stuff you've been taught, all this stuff that you've read is just not true about God. And that's where the enemy loves to enter in. And think about how easy that would have been for Joseph to believe that way, Right? Because he, he was in prison, he saw all of these things, he could have said, yeah, you're right, God is, is not good. But instead, we see the, tr the, the true humility of true faith in Joseph. Okay, that's what it comes down to. We're, going to. we're going to have to ask ourselves, will I be like Job and put my hand over my mouth where I don't understand? In my own life? in the life of the world around me? Or am I going to be the person who shakes his fist against God? Who says, you're, you're just a bad God, Lord. Why would you do this to me? And, and that's why I love what Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a great preacher of the last century, said, if you want a definition of a Christian, 
It's a man who has placed his hand over his mouth. And what he meant by that is is it's a person, a man or a woman who understands who God really is and therefore who they really are. And that's why Job said, I placed my hand over my mouth. He realized I don't have all the answers. I don't know what God is up to. But I do know that he is trustworthy and I am willing and content to leave it there with him. Now, As I mentioned, Acts 2.23 is the place we we go to kind of see how these two intersect, God's sovereignty and our responsibility. Now, you all know I'm a PCA guy, so we're we're Westminster Confession folks, but this is in the Heidelberg. This is in all the great Reformed confessions. But I'll just cite it from the Westminster Confession in that God's sovereignty does not overwhelm or overcome our responsibility. That's where we have to rest, friends. And when you get to Acts 2.23 and you see those two held in tension, you know, Peter telling us about the foreknowledge and definite plan of God and then you by wicked hands took and crucified. As, as we begin to understand sovereignty and responsibility, here's how the confession of faith puts it. There's the primary cause of all things, which is God. And then there's secondary causation. Okay, and this is getting super philosophical and it's after lunch, so eyelids are going to start to get heavy. Let's Just stay with me and it won't be a long excursus into philosophy, okay? But when we talk about primary versus secondary causation, here's what they had in mind. If God is God, and he is, then of course he's the primary cause of everything that comes to happen, or everything that comes to pass. Because if he wasn't sovereign, if he wasn't the one who is the primary cause of all that comes to pass, then there's something else out there that is more sovereign than God, and therefore God is not God. Okay? Now, with secondary causes, what are secondary causes? Well, think about like natural laws. Okay? If you take this book and hold it up this high and drop it, it falls, law of gravity, all these other things, those are secondary causes. That's the way the universe is upheld by God with these certain laws. And one of the major secondary causes of how God brings his plan about are your choices and mine. And so when we talk about the freedom of the will, And agency, like, do you have the agency to make a choice here today? The answer is yes. You made a choice to come here today, okay? You could have stayed in bed, stayed cozy, not fishtailed down the road, you know, on the the snow. You made a choice to be here at these lectures, and the reason you did is because God ordained it, and you chose it. And here's where the real rub comes, friends, that Joseph understood that his brothers didn't. You and I choose what we choose because we love what we love. That's what it comes down to. Okay? So the Bible has a very definite view of human agency, the human will. And it says that you're free to choose according to your desires. So why why aren't more people from Medford sitting here listening to Bible messages today? Because there's no desire for it. Why is there no desire? Because God is sovereign. Why did you want to be here? Why did you desire to be here? Because you're more righteous than other people? No. Because God's shown you grace. And he's regenerated you. And so you want to hear the Bible talked about. We all do if we're Christians. But he uses our choices, those secondary causes, to bring about his plan, and both those are held together. And again, when you try to get the precise relationship of them, we have to come back to, I don't know. And that's not a contradiction when you distinguish it this way. There's primary causes and secondary causes. You choose according to what you desire. None of that's contradictory from a philosophical standpoint. We just don't like it. We don't like that answer. And that's because we've all been so fattened on the teaching of the modern man that you are really sovereign over your life. And that your will is just unfettered and free. And that you are the master of your fate and you are the captain of your soul. And we've all kind of heard that all the time from all around us in the culture. And God comes to that belief and says, I am going to destroy this in your life because I love you. You are not the master of your fate. You are not the captain of your soul, he says to us. I am. 
Always have been and always will be. And so when we try to make sense of these things, friends, when Peter says it like this, when Joseph says it like this, when we're talking about the greatest crime in human history, the crucifixion of the sinless Son of God, and yes, it was a crime, the people who crucified Jesus, even though they did it according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, were still guilty. Pilate should have done better. The soldiers should have said no. That's their ethical obligation before God. And they didn't because God ordained it, and yet they're still responsible. And we will never understand precisely how these interact, and that's okay. That's okay. Because when we understand who God is, and the more we trust who He is, the more it will be okay when we don't understand. And that goes for when, when life gets really hard when really, really bewildering things happen to us. And we have to step back and say, is my faith real? One of the things God is going to do is, is bring about circumstances to destroy our idols. And this is his fatherly love for us, isn't it? When he removes things we think we need in order to make himself more beautiful and believable. And, and he's so committed to you as his child to love you well that it's like when, when my daughter goes to get dessert, inevitably she'll ask Callie, uh, Mama, can I have two Dove chocolates? Yes, you, you can, sweetie. What about three? About four, right? <clears throat> and then like, so kind of do an end around. You're like, oh, I got, already had some Dove chocolate. And then, you know, one, my other daughter will make some cookies and she's like, I didn't have any dessert. You know, can I have a cookie now? And so always trying to get more. And as a good parent, I don't, I hope, you know, want to be a good parent. We don't go, hey, sweetie, that's fine. Just have as much as you want. You know, do, do whatever you want. No, because as a good parent, we realize that it will destroy her if we give in, let her give in to all her desires. And we need to make sure we take certain things away in order to train her well to live as an adult. And remember what Paul says that, that, that he and the apostles were teaching us these wonderful things in the New Testament, this teaching from God for us. Why, why, why were they doing it? To present every person mature in Jesus. Part of our Christian maturity and growth, friends, is the fact that God will limit his children in what they think is what exactly they need, he will take away certain things because he knows that our maturity is more important than what we think we need right now. That's a hard lesson, friends. I'm not trying to downplay how bad that hurts when it happens in our lives. He takes away things. He, he doesn't give us things we think we need. And we say, why are you doing this, God? It just really hurts. It doesn't seem loving. And he says, be patient. So, as Joseph finishes this portion here, he says, this is going to happen. His eyes on the cross, he sees what's coming. And as we finish up here this afternoon, let, let's just make a few quick points of application. Now, let me say two things. Um, how do we overcome this judgmental spirit most of us have? And again, just if, if all of us are doing this all the time, and this is kind of the cardinal sin for secular people today. You're being judgy, right? That's what we're, we're told. And as a result, that, that's the most, um, you find the most misunderstood and misapplies, misapplied um, Bible verse of all time. You know, when you hear somebody, you're, you're evangelizing, and you're talking about Jesus being the only way, and somebody says, that's so judgmental. And don't you know that Jesus said, do not judge, lest you be judged. Like, that's the kind of crushing comeback to all Christians. We want to say a couple things in reply to that. First, Jesus actually does say to judge, John 7, I think 23. When you judge, judge with righteous judgment. So he is about judging righteously. What he's against is self-righteous judgment. But here's what happens when we hear this from folks who are not Christians. Um, he, and Joseph's response helps us here. He tells his brothers that he's not their judge, and then... Jesus, as it were, tells us two things about our hearts and his right. 
Okay, our hearts and Jesus is right. Joseph recognized what Jesus would later teach, which is we do not have the right to self-righteous judgment. So when somebody says you're sound judgmental, we want to come back and say, I don't have the right to judge you. And, and the thing is, the person who has experienced a small amount of grace will always be quick to find fault in others. As one of the old writers put it, uh, the person who doesn't understand grace well will be soft on himself and hard on others. And the person who understands Jesus' grace well will be easy on others and hard on themselves. Be hard on your own sin. You'll see your own sin more clearly, right? And so when, when we talk about our hearts, we are bent towards self-righteousness. And one of the things that Jesus is going to do is bring situations in our lives that test how we respond to people we really want to judge harshly. And we really want to get self-righteous with. That he says, turn the other cheek towards. This doesn't mean turn the other cheek in every instance of like somebody's beating you up or abusing you and then that you're just supposed to take that. No. But it's talking in, in the context there of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about the day-to-day -day little things that can add up to us getting really frustrated with each other. He's saying, bear the offense. That's what's going to make you salt and light in the world because the world has enough self-righteous, judgmental people. By the way, did you notice that about what happens when you hear from like a secular worldview? Hey, you shouldn't be so judgy. You, you will find that secular people can be some of the most judgmental people you'll ever meet. Right? I've seen that. Um, you can believe what you want as long as you agree with me. Then we're good. That's kind of what dominates our public discourse on both sides of the aisle right now. Hey, we have freedom of speech as long as it's like what I want you to say, right? And so as Christians, we have a real opportunity here to say, I don't have to react when you say something mean to me, when you slight me, because I am so content in Jesus. It's like what uh, Jack Miller, writer a number of years ago, used to say when somebody would tell him something, like say something mean to him or be critical of him in a mean spirit, he would say, you don't even know half of how bad I am. <laughs> you think you're telling me something serious about myself here. It's worse than you ever imagined. <laughs> okay? And that's, that's for all of us, friends. So as we think about our hearts, here's what Jesus says about his right. The reason we don't have to, the right to be self-righteous is because all of us deserve judgment. And so when Joseph asks the question, am I in the place of God? The only person who can answer yes to that is Jesus. Because he is in the place of God. He does get the right to judge. And here's the question we have to ask ourselves that Joseph's brothers still hadn't learned, but that Joseph had, is would we ever want Jesus to judge us the same way we react to other people or judge other people? Would you ever want Jesus to deal with you the way you deal with people in your worst moments? And isn't it so comforting to know that Jesus doesn't ever have bad moments like we do? Isn't it comforting to know that Jesus doesn't have a temper that gets to a boiling point with us? Isn't it comforting to know that when we are so tempted to go after other people and play the scenario in our mind of how we deal with them, that Jesus never imagines that with you and me, his children? When he said, it is finished on the cross, he wasn't speaking hyperbolically. He meant it. He meant there's no more anger or wrath towards you, that you'll never exhaust his patience, that you'll never, ever be in a position of being judged by him again because all of the Father's judgment fell on him. Joseph knew that, and that's why he rejoiced and said, take my bones with you because I don't want to be left behind in Egypt. I want to be, as it were, coming back to life in the land of Canaan when the greater Savior comes. So as you think about being judgmental, think about Jesus not being judgmental with you. And that ought to change our perspective on everything. And then the last thing we learn from this text is that what our intellects cannot understand 
where we are find our natural limitations with human reason, faith takes over and worships where it cannot understand. Not because it's a blind leap in the dark, and this is very important, because most of the history of Western thought is, well, reason takes you so far, and it comes to the end, and then you've got to make this blind leap in the dark, and there's no good reason for it. No, 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 no. Notice in Joseph's life, he's got amply good reasons to believe, even when he can't understand. He's got God speaking to him personally. So do we, by the way. Okay, he's got those ample good reasons, but here's the thing, here's the difference. It's not a blind leap in the dark, it's a bowing of the knee when we have incomplete information about the plan. We've got all we need in the Bible, but it's still not everything God is going to do. He doesn't have to tell us everything he's doing. He's told us enough for what we need, and that's what's so maddening to modern people is we feel like we have the right to know exhaustively what God is doing. He has never promised us that, friends. And so when he says to us, wait, stay where you are, don't be afraid, don't be judgmental, and it's so hard for us What we have to do is, if we know we're really getting close and and walking with the Lord, when we can bow the knee and say, I don't understand God, but I still trust. I may never understand, and that's okay. Can we say that? I may never understand God, and that's okay. Because the whys that are in your life, they may be tiny, but they become like, dripping on a foundation. You let that drip long enough, it begins to erode the foundation, and eventually the whole thing collapses. You've got to deal with those why questions. And the ultimate answer to all of them is, God does what he pleases. And if we are not willing to accept God on God's terms, it's because we have not come to terms with who we really are. So this text presents us with a choice. Will I let what I cannot understand cause me to worship or run away from God? What you can't understand, will it cause you to worship or run away from God? I was reading the story of uh, Helen Rosevere recently. Some of y'all know that name, great missionary. She was a Cambridge-trained doctor and was in the African Congo during the revolution in the 1960s. And she told this incredibly poignant story, heartbreaking story, horrifying story of when the the revolutionaries came into the village uh, where she had ministered for so long. She she had been this incredibly brilliant doctor and sacrificed a lot to go bring medicine to the Congo. And they kidnapped her. And she has this moving piece of the story. She talks about hearing the soldiers come to get her on a Saturday afternoon. And for the next 72 hours, they did horrifying things to her friend horrifying things. And she recounts that in the middle of one of those episodes with what these soldiers were doing to her, she said, I felt God ask me something like, will you still believe me? Will you still love me? Can I trust you with this pain even if you don't understand why I'm entrusting it to you? And she said she felt like she could say to him, yes, God. And she said, it didn't make the soldier stop. But she said, instantly I felt light, free. They brought her into a village. They'd set up a trial, a mock trial, a kangaroo court, where they were, as typical of this revolutionary game plan, they got all the workers. Isn't it funny how these violent people claim to speak for the people? Anyway, um, that's just typical of all these things. They get all these workers together, And they gin them up and they say, we're going to bring this white woman out here for a trial. And what they had planned to do was crucify her. They knew they'd find her guilty. And so they begin, it was shameful for a woman in this culture to admit what had happened to her at the hands of these men. So they begin to try to get her to confess. They're slapping her with the butts of the rifle. They've knocked some of her teeth out at this point. She can barely speak. And as they're doing this, one 
of the farmers stands up and says, this is not right. And everybody starts to calm down. And they ask her again, because they see they're about to start losing the crowd, you know, will you confess? And she says, yes, I confess that Jesus is Lord. And I love him, that I'm here to serve him along those lines. And this begins to turn the whole crowd, and they say, this, this woman is one of us. She served us. And years later, when Rosevere told this story, she would take a rose, and she would begin to name her losses and begin to peel a petal off. Okay, it might have been the loss of not having um, the, the life she wanted or this loss or the big loss of like what had happened to her at that time in the Congo. And then the, the flowers, the, the petal would eventually be gone and you just have the rose stem with its thorns. She would talk about the trials that God had given her and break off a thorn. And then she would take a knife out and begin to peel back the, the, the green part of the rose's stem to reveal that that light-hued part underneath. And as she began to peel it back, she would talk about what God had been stripping away from her. And as she would whittle it down, it came to a point. And she would always say, God let me go from being a rose and made me into an arrow. And the only way he could do that is if I wasn't a rose any longer. That's the lesson Joseph learned. All the peeling back of the petals, all the things being stripped away. And when Joseph was given pain, I'm sure the same question was asked of him. And I tell that story simply to illustrate the fact that it can go really bad for us and you can still know that God is really good. And that's what Joseph learned. That's what all of us are going to have to learn. Whoever it is, whatever it is, minute for evil, God will work all things together for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Let's pray. Well, thank you for your word. Thank you for even the hard parts that are difficult to understand. We confess our own limitations here this afternoon and ask that you give us grace, God, to believe where we cannot see, to go where we don't feel led, to believe when unbelief seems so much wiser and better. And above all, to see that you are not finished with us yet, you are not finished with this world yet, and there will come a day when resurrection reality breaks in upon this sad, broken world. Until that day, Lord, keep us faithful, keep us close to Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Thanks so much, Dr. Fleur, for walking us through those four lectures. We're going to take just a couple minutes to uh, change the stage up, move some furniture. If you need to stay on stretch, please do so. But uh, we're going to start our Q&A in about five minutes. <laughs>